Hi everyone, this is the second part of the Unit 11 topic. So we are talking about endogeneity or random uh, explanatory variables. And today we're going to talk about the tests that you can use to see if you have this problem of endogeneity. We've already talked about what to do about it when you have it. So that uh, brings us to the end of Unit 11 and there isn't a whole lot left to do for the course. So uh, you are uh, over the top now and the end is in sight. So grab your pens and your paper and let's get this done. Okay, let's talk today about how we test for whether we need to use an instrumental variables estimator. Um, and the one point I want to emphasize here is uh, we only use IV if it's necessary. Um, in the case of uh, the heteroscedasticity correction using White's errors, there are now textbooks, for instance, <clears throat> that say, just use it all the time, even if you don't know whether it's needed, because um, it doesn't change the slope coefficients, and it just might improve the variances. Um, in the case of time series regression, it's the same thing. A lot of econometricians will just say, you know what, just use Newey West all the time, even if you're not sure if you need them. This is not true for instrumental variables, though, because it can really change the slope coefficients themselves. And we like using OLS <clears throat> wherever possible because um, it's a well-understood method, and people know what the least square slope coefficients mean. So it's important to have a test for whether we really need to use instrumental variables. So. Um, What's our test? Well, let's state the null hypothesis first. The null hypothesis is that the covariance between x and epsilon equals zero. Now, if that's true, um, then the OLS and the instrumental variables estimators will both be consistent. Um, actually, they'll both be consistent uh, either way, whether that's true or not, because if that's not true, the instrumental variable estimator is consistent, and OLS is also consistent itself. Um, but there's something else that will be true. Um, and the OLS estimator will equal the instrumental variable estimator. So... They'll both be consistent, and they'll both equal each other. Um, now, if the null hypothesis is false, then in this case, um, <coughs> the instrumental variable estimator won't equal the OLS estimator because the OLS estimator will be biased. So. If this holds true, they're both going to be consistent, and they're both unbiased, and they'll equal each other. But if this is not true, so if we have that, if that covariance is not equal to zero, the instrumental variable estimator will still be consistent, but the OLS estimator will be different. It will be biased. And so what we're going to do is set up a, a, um, a test statistic that's going to measure this. It's based on the idea that under the null hypothesis, there's no difference between these estimators. The two will be equal to each other. 
And this is a case where the underlying theory gets complicated and hard to follow, but the test statistic that comes out of it, fortunately, is very easy. Uh, it's very simple and intuitive. So um, let's suppose that we've got a regression model, um, just a single variable regression model, and we have an instrument for x, and we'll call that z. So we think that we have potentially an endogeneity bias, and we have an instrumental variable that we can use for x. Then all we have to do is run the following regression. Uh, alpha plus beta x plus, we'll call a coefficient uh, gamma, So what we've done is we've put the x variable itself and the instrumental variable into the equation. And then we look at a t-test on gamma. Uh, and then that t-test on gamma tests our null hypothesis that beta hat OLS equals beta hat IV. Um, <clears throat> in a sense, what it's, you can think of this as, well, if x is the actual explanatory variable and z isn't adding any information to the model that will change the value of beta, then that means beta was unbiased to begin with. So by adding this variable in, by adding the z variable in and testing whether it it's, makes a significant contribution to the regression model, that's equivalent to testing whether um, the instrumental variable estimator and the OLS estimator are the same thing. Now, in the textbook, uh, it's... Uh, oh, uh, I should also mention, this is called the Hausman test. Jerry Hausman, um, the econometrician who devised this... Uh, it devised a whole class of hypothesis tests um, that work in this way. Um, let me switch to a new page here. Um, <coughs> and I'll talk about the textbook, textbook example. So we have um, a multivariate regression, so it's alpha plus beta 1, x1, plus beta 2, x2, plus beta 3, x3, plus epsilon. And um, we think that these two variables in the model are potentially endogenous, uh, meaning that they're potentially correlated with epsilon. So we're going to use a whole bunch of outside instrumental variables for these. So we've got, um, for x2, we've got two instrumental variables, z1 and z2, and x3, we've got three instrumental variable estimators, z3, z4, and z5. Um, and again, I want to try to help you get, get a bit of intuition, because this is a puzzling idea that you'd use Another variable here, um, one thing that doesn't come up in the textbook discussion here is the question, well, if Z1 and Z2 explain X2, maybe they belong in the model. And so here there's another issue, um, which at this point we don't uh, worry about, but you might have been wondering about this, which is why, do, why we don't just have Z1 and Z2 in the model in the first place. And here the idea is the instruments, in principle, they're chosen because they, they only influence the dependent variable by influencing x2. They don't directly influence the dependent variable. And um, uh, so that makes, that's another condition that we add to the selection of 
instrumental variables. Um, so let's say um, this is a measure of um, agricultural productivity. So we're looking at counties all across the country and we're looking at agricultural output. And one of our explanatory variables is investment in the capital stock of agriculture. Um, well, you might think, okay, there's a bit of an endogeneity problem there because people will invest more in um, regions of the country that have better growing conditions. So if this is investment in the capital stock in agriculture and this is agricultural output in that region, well, this depends on this just as much as this depends on this. So what we would want to do is say, well, can we think of variables that would explain the amount of investment in the capital stock in the agricultural sector that aren't themselves functions of the current output of the agricultural sector? Um, so um, then we might think of, let's say, the the um, borrowing rate at banks. Okay, that's going to influence the amount of investment that takes place, but that's not typically a function of how much corn was grown in Wellington County last year. Um, so uh, that might be one of our instruments. Um, and another instrument might be um, some measure of technological change in um, the, uh, the design of harvesting equipment. Um, so if there's a, uh, a change in the way um, harvesting equip harvesters are, are made, then farmers might go out and invest, uh, build new or buy new ones if, if they're better than the old ones. Um, but technological improvements in um, capital equipment and agriculture aren't a function of how much corn was grown last year in Wellington County. So um, then in that case, uh, these would be instruments. And then you'd also have to check, though, do those variables just belong in the model themselves? Well, they only belong in the model to the extent that they influence the capital stock in agriculture. And um, so that's kind of the logic here of, of choosing instruments that belong in your model because they influence the explanatory variable, but they're not themselves determined by the dependent variable. So let's say we have this example then. We've got um, uh, this variable, we're going to instrument it using Z1 and Z2. For this variable, we're going to instrument it using Z1 and Z, or Z3, 4, and 5. So you do that by running a regression. Um, so you regress x2 on z1 and z2, and that gives you the predicted values from that regression, x2 hat. And you regress x3 on z3, 4, and 5, and that gives you x3 hat. So the predicted values from that regression. And so then what we do is regress, sorry, I'm just flipping my page over here. Um, regress y on x1, x2, x3, x2 hat, and x3 hat. Um, and here you're just using OLS. Okay, you, you, for the Hausman test, you're just using OLS. You don't use an instrumental variable regressor here. Um, and then the Hausman test would be an F test on whether x2 hat and x3 hat are jointly equal to zero. And if you can't reject that, then that means your null hypothesis, you can't reject the null hypothesis, which is, and the null hypothesis here is that you don't have an endogeneity bias problem, where you don't have, uh, you don't need to use an instrumental variables estimator. Um, so that, again, is the Hausman test. 
And that's how you do it if you're going to do it mechanically. But in R, like any other package, um, there's, a, um, there's an automated way of doing this. So um, uh, the program itself will run this and, and um, construct the F-test and um, give you a p-value on it. But if you wonder what the package is doing, well, that's, that's what it's doing. It's actually a fairly simple um, test. All right, so that is the Hausman test, and um, if this test rejects, if that if the null rejects, then that would mean um, you do have an endog potential endogeneity bias or, or random co random x problem, and so you should use instrumental variables. Okay, um, there is a, a test of whether these are good instruments or not. So that's a separate issue from whether you need to use instrumental variables. Um, it's called the Sargon test. And I think we're just going to skip this one. Okay, so uh, you can skip that material. Let's have a look in the textbook. Not because it's unimportant. It is important. But um, actually, w when you run in a stat, in an econometrics package, uh, like R, when you run the Hausman test, it'll give you the Sargon test as well anyway. And it's not all that complicated what the Sargon test is. It's just, I think we've learned enough uh, on this subject. Um, and if you go on, for instance, if you do labor economics, um, instrumental variables are very important in labor economics. So you, you would probably learn some more of the IV methodology. So where are we? Okay, so... I am at page 154, so that's a Hausman test. goes through. It's a nice explanation of the Hausman test, by the way. Um, and then we get the Sargon test here, and this is the part where you don't have to worry about that. So that gets us to section 5.5.3. Why might the explanatory variable be correlated with error? So I'm going to talk about that. I did this part last time, which is you might have measurement error. And... Um, uh, so we did that last time. In the textbook, he goes through the simultaneous equations model. And I'm going to get you again to skip this part. Um, I talked about last time that um, if you have supply and demand data, you've got quantity and prices, that's an endogeneity problem. So you've got quantity as a function of price, but then price is also a function of quantity. And you don't know whether you're picking up supply side or demand side effects. However, the simultaneous equations model is a more complicated version of this than we need. Um, so this, uh, this situation arises when you've got a system of equations. You want to estimate them all at once. And in that system, you've got some are endogenous, some variables are endogenous and some are exogenous. And so that's a very important in econometric modeling where, like I say, you're going to estimate a whole system of equations at once rather than just a single multivariate equation. Um, and um, I think it, this is not the time in your econometrics career to try to digest those two issues at once, which is how to estimate a system of equations and deal with instrumental variables. Um, and then this, so that takes us to page 162. You can skip all of that. Um, and then um, the last part here is uh, an example. And so go through that. That's just a bit more of the intuition about instrumental variables. Instead of the simultaneous equations model, I'm just going to work through a simpler example of endogeneity. It's um, <coughs> question one in the... Um, the lab unit. I think I mentioned last time. It's kind of a hard question. Um, so um, here is the question. Um, we've got a regression equation y equals beta x plus e1i. And um, but we also suspect that x is a function of y. 
equals E2I. All right, so the causality can go both ways here. Um, and the question says um, to prove um, if both are true, then the covariance of X and this error term does not equal zero. <coughs> um, now, uh, one thing I need to add is we're going to assume that um, this error term is distributed normally with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared one. <coughs> so that's the, the variance for the first error term. And then the second error term is distributed normally sigma squared two. And we're assuming that they are independent of each other. Okay, so um, that's the first equation. That's the second equation. The way to do this is rearrange the second equation. So um, we are going to have um, x minus gamma y equals e2i. And then we'll divide through both sides by gamma. So 1 over gamma xi minus y equals 1 over gamma e2. Um, and then I'm going to take the y over to this side. <clears throat> so the minus sign will become a positive, will become a plus. I'm going to take this over here. So this will be a minus sign. So I have 1 over gamma x minus 1 over gamma e2 equals y. <clears throat> um, so that is um, in the solutions. That's the first part here. And now I set the two equations equal to each other. So now I use equation one. So I've got this part equals y, which equals beta x plus e1. Um, and now what I want to do is solve for x. Um, so what am I doing here? Um, I have these two equations and um, two equations and two unknowns. So I can solve for what x equals just in terms of uh, beta and the error terms, beta, gamma, and the error terms. So let's see, I've got this thing, and I've got this thing, and I want to set them equal to each other. So I'm going to have um, 1 over gamma x minus beta x will equal 1 over gamma e2 plus ei. Um, and then I collect terms. So I've got x, 1 over gamma minus beta equals 1 over gamma e2 plus ei <coughs> and I do the division so I end up with 1 over gamma e2 plus ei oh, sorry e1i 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 yes where all did I make that mistake I think that's it E1i, yes. Okay, and then 1 over gamma minus beta. So that's x. That's this thing right here. That's x. Um, and now before I do the, um, the next part, I'm going to tidy that up a little bit. So I've got x equals, what did I say? 1 over gamma e2i plus e1i, or 1 over gamma minus beta. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by gamma. Um, so that equals, so gamma cancels out. I have two, E2i plus uh, gamma E1i. Because remember, I'm multiplying by gamma, top and bottom, over 1 minus gamma beta. Um, Okay, and then what I want to do now is 
calculate the covariance of X and E1I. And um, one thing I'm using here is that the mean of X equals zero. So that's our assumption. When we don't have a constant term here, it's because we assume that mean of X is zero. And also the mean of the error term is zero. So this covariance then will be just the expected value of the two of them multiplied together. So that is the expected value of E2I plus gamma E1I over 1 minus gamma beta oops, times E. Did that again. E1I. Don't know why I do that. Um, <clears throat> okay, then, um, so this part on the bottom is a constant, so I'm going to take it outside the expectation. So I have 1 over 1 minus gamma beta times the expected value of E2i plus gamma E1i times E1i. Um, And um, so we'll have 1 over 1 minus gamma beta times, now when I distribute these terms, it'll be E1i, E2i plus gamma E1i squared. Um, now, I'm assuming that these are uncorrelated. They're independent of each other. So that equals zero. All right, so um, <clears throat> I mentioned that in the setup of the question, uh, these are independent of each other. So we can assume that they equal zero. And then what we're left with will be, um, and that's a constant, so I can take it outside the expectation, gamma over one minus gamma beta the expected value of E1i squared, and that is our variance. That's the variance of the first error term. So we end up with gamma over 1 minus gamma beta, sigma squared 1. And that is <clears throat> this expression here. And um, so unless gamma equals 0, this does not equal 0. Um, and if, if gamma equals zero, then that means this equation isn't true. That means x is not a function of y. But if x is a function of y, if gamma is not equal to zero, <coughs> then that covariance is not equal to zero. And that is how we have our instrumental variables issue come up. So... Um, That is, um, um, that's the solution to the first question in the labs. Um, but I'll leave the others for you to take up with your TA on Friday. <coughs> and um, that's all. So I think we're going to uh, wrap up our uh, uh, Chapter 5 treatment with that. And that means we are wrapped up with everything in the textbook. And next week, all I want to do is... Um, present the matrix algebra version of our regression uh, notation and then a review of the course. So um, that's all and uh, I will talk to you again next time.